remember last year in 2023, I said we have a word for the year, and the word was baited to. Remember? Going outside, moving outside. Because the Lord of the, Je of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are here to, in preparation and equipping for our ministry work to build up the saints, but also to be the light of the world. He says, do you not know that you are the light of the world, a city set upon a hill that cannot be hidden? So it doesn't help when we come together and we shine for one another. No. This is the place where you are soaked in the word and soaked in the Holy Spirit so that you can shine where you operate, where you work, where you study, where you walk, where you, where you are. Because I cannot be there, you are there. And Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You are a city set upon a hill that cannot be hidden. So for people in darkness, the a light is very obvious. It's a beacon of hope. For those who are in darkness, for those in light, we are just shining brighter together. But for one that is sitting in darkness, that's sitting in depression and addiction and sickness, hopelessness, that's in the, in the presence of a divorce or where relationships is crumbling and where work situations is impossible, you are that light that that person is looking to. You are that salt that gives meaning to that person's life. And uh, the word that I want to share this morning is because we want to do this and, and train ourselves also in the word of God concerning healing. I'm reading from Luke 5. I'm going to run through a couple of scriptures, so please make notes, or if you want to go with me through your Bible. Otherwise, for those who are listening, just keep the pen and paper ready so that you go and study this afterwards, because we need to get the Word inside of us. Amen? Church Arise is a Word church, spirit and Word. So very st we're strong in the Word, but strong in the Spirit also. And you cannot... Ha, just have the spirit, then you will blow up. You cannot just have the word, then you will dry up. But if you have the spirit and the word, you will grow up. Amen? That was, thank you, Jesus. Amen. So we want to grow because that was the intention from the beginning was so that we can be formed. Another word for grow is formed. Because as you grow, form takes place. We want, to, we, we want to be formed in the image and the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when he saw the confidence in him springing from their faith, the context of the scriptures, those four friends that carried the paralyzed man, remember? They, he could not walk. I don't know if he was conscious or he was awake. But these four friends decided to bring their friend to Jesus. And the crowd was so, he was so crowded that they could not reach him. So they, they pressed through and they could not reach him because they realized and understood something without conversation or without a message that they have to bring him into the presence of Jesus. So we come to the presence and you will see later in the scriptures how important it is to come into the proximity of the presence of Jesus. And the only way we can come to Jesus today is through the power of the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit. So where the presence of the Lord is, there is the Spirit. And where the Spirit is, there is the Lord. Are you with me, church? So you need to press through. And when they could not reach him, they came through the roof. The word say, says when he saw their confidence, not the sick man's. So it busts again the myth about you don't have enough faith. When God doesn't heal you, the religion says or religious spirit says you don't have enough faith. Or you did something wrong so that God cannot heal you. So this busts the, the myth that it is your faith that is present for healing. No, we can have faith for you. Amen. We can have faith for you. Your friends, your mother, your father, your husband, your wife can have faith for you when you're sick. Because when you're sick, you're sick. When you're dead, you're dead. You don't have faith. Lazarus doesn't have faith. 
So by the faith of Jesus, he called him out. Amen. So when he, and when he saw, listen to the description of faith, the confidence in him. So faith is confidence in Jesus springing from their faith. He said, man, your sins are forgiven, you. And the scribes, the religious dudes, and the Pharisees began to reason and question and argue, saying, who is this man that blasphemes? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Listen, but Jesus, knowing their thoughts, so he didn't hear them. They were, you know, underneath their breath, they were speaking to one another and saying, who's this man? Who's this man? Who is who's he thinking he is? And so Jesus, knowing their thoughts and questionings, answered them. Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has the, not the Son of God, the Son of Man. Because in that moment, he was the Son of Man. He came into the flesh so that we can have an example of somebody sent from God that the Word became flesh. Because amongst us, in you, as you receive the Word, as you worship Jesus, as you behold Jesus, as you spend time with Jesus in your own quiet time and in the Word, the Word is becoming flesh again in you. The word is becoming flesh. So that is why Jesus said, but that you may know that the Son of Man has the power of authority and right on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, arise, pick up your litter, your stretcher, and go to your own house. And this we need to understand, the power of forgiveness the power that forgiveness and healing is, is, is linked to one another. It's like a twin. Forgiveness brings healing and healing brings forgiveness. It's the same operation. It's the same working of the Spirit. So when we come and Jesus said, he said first, he said, your sins are forgiven. And then they start to question. And then he said, what is easier? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, arise and walk? Your sins are forgiven, or that pancreas be healed in Jesus' name. Your sins are forgiven, or that headaches be gone in Jesus' name. Your sins are forgiven, or that allergies go in Jesus' name. Your sins are forgiven, or cancer go in Jesus' name. It's the same power. It's the same faith. The difference is the one we feel, the other one we don't feel. So then we get stuck in our feelings. I don't feel healed because the pain is still there. But you receive something unseen as forgiveness. When God brings you forgiveness, you experience the forgiveness in your heart. You re experience the release because the Greek word for, for forgiveness is the remitting of an offense, debt or fault. It is the remitting or the release of a debt a fault or an offense. So when God says, when Jesus says, I forgive you, it is the same as I release you of any debt, of any trespass, of any offense. I release you. That is forgiveness. When he says, I heal you, I release you from that sickness. I release you from that disease. It's the same power, the same faith, the same Christ. It is we have a blockage because we are not trained in the word to understand that faith, that forgiveness and healing is co coinciding with one another. It says in John 20, listen to the power. That's why forgiveness is so powerful. And John 20, 21 to 23, this you know. You know, church arise, you know the scripture. And Jesus said to them, the disciples, peace to you. Just as the Father has sent me forth, so I am sending you. And having said this, he breathed on them. He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. This was not Pentecost. This was before 
Pentecost. Dat was voor die uitstorting van die Heilige Geest. So he breathed upon his disciples because he was sending them into the world to preach the gospel. Amen. He says in 23, now having, now church, do you have the Holy Spirit? Okay. Almod, how do I know I have the Holy Spirit? The, Holy, the word says in Romans 8, if you, the Spirit testifies with your spirit, you're a child of God. You cannot say I'm a child of God if the Holy Spirit does not testify with your spirit. If I ask you, are you a child of God? You say, mm, um, uh, I'm not sure. Then there's no witness. Then the Holy Spirit does not witness. But if I ask you, are you a child of God? You say, yes, Alma. Then there's a witness. That is the presence of the Holy Spirit. So when we, in the beginning, when we started to pray in tongues, I did... Uh, um, Two years ago, I think, I did a teaching on power of tongues. I will place it tomorrow again on the group so you can listen. Why do we need to pray in tongues? What is the power of praying in tongues? Amen. So it says now, now, he says, okay, disciples, now having received the Holy Spirit, now church your eyes, by uh, received the Holy Spirit and being led and directed by him, if you forgive sins, the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. Look at the power. I want you to see something. That man that was sick, Jesus did not a consultation with him. He did not consult him. Jesus act on the faith of the four friends. The faith of the four friends triggered a response from Jesus. And he did not ask what is wrong. He did not ask how long do you have it. Sometimes he does that. Remember, he asked the, the father of the child that was, had the seizures that threw him in the fire and in the water. He, he spoke to the father and he said, how long? Remember that? So we don't look for recipes. Just eat the word and let faith come by hearing and hearing of the, of the word. Okay. And be led and directed by the Spirit. So Jesus shows us he's being led and directed by the Spirit in that moment. He did not address the man. He did not consult the man. He just said, your sins are forgiven. Rise up and walk. Because faith was present. So now he says, church arise, you have received the Holy Spirit. And being led and directed by him, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. Ni yamar. In say no more, in what us? No, your sins are forgiven. Then he says, look at the power of forgiveness. If you retain the sins of anyone, they are retained. If you keep it against them, if you hold it against them, they are in a prison. Come on, church. Forgiveness, the word for forgiveness is to release. So if you forgive someone, you say, go, be free. If you don't forgive, you hold. You hold them. And then the word says, the, the, the prayer that Jesus taught, he says, forgive me as I, come on church, as I forgive. So if I hold on to, and I keep my forgiveness, guess what is going to happen to me? Forgive me as I forgive. If I don't forgive, God cannot forgive and release me. So I have to release. I have to let them go. Because it's hurting me more than the one that I'm not for forgiving. Okay? So now he says, listen to this. The word, while the work, the, the Greek word, Afimai, translated as forgiveness, implies letting go or, or release. Just put your hands like this and say, Lord, I release them. You know, you know who it is. Again, Lord, I release them in Jesus' name. That is forgiveness. That is forgiveness. Similar, another Greek word used for forgiveness is charisumai, means to give free and unconditional forgiveness. Nie as jy dit doen, sal ek jou vergewe nie. 
Where in the Bible ever did Jesus say, if you do this, I will forgive you? If you do this, I will forgive you. No, he died a sinner so that we can be forgiven. There's no condition to forgiveness except to come to Jesus. There's no condition. So why do you have conditions for your forgiveness? Come on, church. And I'm speaking to myself. Why do we have conditional forgiveness? If when we come to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me. He releases us immediately. He let us go. It says, also the word charisumai comes from a Greek word charis, which means grace. And grace means undeserved favor. There's no merits. We want people to say, I did this, and I, I'm so sorry, and I'm so sorry, and I did, and I hurt you. And sometimes it's good to do that because the word says, it says when we confess our trespasses, God is faithful to forgive us. But this, that's the only condition. Is just come, come. Next to yes, just come. Because forgiveness is in the power of the blood. It releases you. And 2 Corinthians 2, Paul comes. And remember, Paul was not present in that, that, that meeting in John. Remember? He was not present when Luke was spoke, when Luke witnessed, when Jesus said, Arise, be, your sins are forgiven, go and walk. He was not there. He was not present. He was not present in that meeting when Jesus <sighs> breathed upon the disciples. But he comes in 2 Corinthians 2 and he says, If you forgive anyone anything... I too forgive that one. And what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sakes in the presence and with the approval of Christ. Come on, church. Paul says, if you forgive anyone anything, I too forgive. So when you come and say, Alma, I forgave this, and I say, oh, ya mar remember. No, no. So if you forgive and release, I agree with your forgiveness for Christ's sake and for that person's sake and for your sake. I too agree with you. To keep why, why church, why is the power of forgiveness so profound and why is unforgiveness so detrimental to your health, to your being? It says to keep Satan from getting the advantage over us. For we are not ignorant of his wiles and intention. Because if I don't forgive church, what is the opposite of, uh, uh, of forgiveness? Acc accusation. I hold you an, in accusation. You did this to me. You will pay. Come on. But forgiveness is release. So if I don't, if I keep you, I'm accusing you. And in that, and I'm judging you. And the word says, with the same measure that you measure, come on, you will be measured with. So that's why he says, don't judge. Because with the judgment you judged, you will be judged. So it's, you are actually hurting yourself. It's like someone, you know that phrase. It's like you drink the poison and you expect them to die. That's unforgiveness. You drink the poison, but you expect them to die. That is the power of unforgiveness. It, it's poison to your body. It's poison to your spirit. It's poison to your mind. And Paul says, forgive one another. Why? To keep Satan from getting the advantage over us. For we are not ignorant of his wiles and intention because he's the great accuser. So when we keep, keep our forgiveness back, hold our forgiveness back, we are playing in the ring with, the, with Satan. We are playing the same game that Satan plays. Amen? James 5, it says from verse 13, listen to, listen to the instruction of, of James. James. He says, Jacobus, he says, Is anyone among you afflicted? What does if afflicted mean? Ill-treated? Are you ill-treated at work? Are you ill-treated at school? Are you ill-treated at home? 
doesn't matter, are you ill-treated or suffering evil, then his, his recommendation is, and his counsel is, you should pray. Are you ill-treated? You should pray. Come in your prayer closet and start to pray. He says, is anyone glad of heart? He should sing praise to God. Did God break through some, something for you? Come and praise him. Give glory to God. Then he says, is anyone among you sick? He should call in the church elders, the spiritual guides, and they should pray. Listen, they should pray over him, anointing him with oil in the Lord's name and the prayer that is of faith. The prayer that is of faith will save him who is sick. And the Lord will restore him. And, he, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Singular. Again, once again, sickness and forgiveness, healing and forgiveness. It works together. He says in verse 16 now, he says, confess to one another, therefore your faults, he defines it and amplified. He says, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins. And I told you, I used to and, and do, if I have a problem and I cannot get over it, I, I'm, I'm struggling with forgiveness or I'm struggling with something in my life, I go to a more spiritual mature person and I say, I want to confess today. I'm struggling with this in my life. I'm struggling to get victory over this thing in my life because the word says, if I confess my fault or my, he says, my slips or my false steps or my offenses or my sins, he says, when we do that and pray for one another, so after I confess, I say, please pray with me. Then the word says that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. It is like when Cornelia or Joshua or Josh tune their guitar. They have a tuner. So they, they pluck the string and then they, it makes a tone. And then they match the tone. That is the same way. So the Holy Spirit comes and it tunes us. Again to a healthy spiritual tone in our mind and in our hearts. And that is the power of confession. And that's what the Catholic Church, they nailed it right there. It is something very, very powerful. Confession. To go to confession. Because this is the word, this is the truth, this is the power of confession. To come to your spiritual elder, or come to me, or come to somebody that you look up spiritually, that is a mentor to, to you, that will not gossip about what you confessed. But will, uh, will understand the power of the word and say, Alma, I'm struggling with this thing in my life. And I'm confessing. Sometimes I'm good and sometimes I have a slip. Sometimes I have a false step. Sometimes I, I really, there's an offense in my heart. I have carry, I'm carrying an offense in my heart. And there's a sin. I'm sinning in this way. And I want to confess it today under the blood of Jesus. And I want you to pray for me. Because the word says, I will be healed. I will be restored. I will be tuned. I will be in tune again with the Holy Spirit in my mind and in my heart. Come on, church. That is the power of confession. And the, something that we, the shame, you must not ever underestimate the power of shame. Because as long as you are shamed, ashamed, the devil has power over you. And shame wants to hide. You want to hide that trespass, that sin, that offense, that slip. But the moment you obey the word, you act on the word, and you say, Alma, I want to confess this, that power is broken. I'm watching pornography, and the moment you confess it, that power is broken, and you can be restored. You can be healed. Come on, church. I'm addicted to this. I'm, I'm confessing. I'm addicted to this or that or this substance or that. I'm addicted. And the moment you confess it, the power is there for restoration. The power is there for healing and tuning in again. It happened to me a couple of times, as, and, and afterwards, but those two incidents, it's 
it's standing out and stood out for me in all these years. I remember we were in, in Jeffreys and I was standing on the seashore looking at the sea, minding my own business. And I told you this before. I was just and the kids, Joshua and Paul and Yaku were still small and they were playing and I was just standing watching them. And the next moment, a, a young girl just stepped in, in into my, my eye, eyesight. I could see my peripheral. I could see her. And she started to talk. And what she said is, I want to, I want to run away from home. And I, I looked, who is she talking to? And she was talking to me. And I don't know this woman. I don't know this young lady. But she started to confess. She just stood there and she said, I want to run away from home. I cannot, I cannot anymore. I cannot. And then I started to talk to her and I ministered to her. I remember one time in Woolies, I was just browsing through the clothes, you know, just browsing. And the next moment, a lady came and she started to, to browse next to me and she started to confess. She just... And the word for confess, listen to this. The word confess is the Greek word exumulo or whatever. Rabalaba shata. Uh, a word that means to declare. To declare, it was, it is, it, listen, it is to say out loud. Listen, to exclaim, to divulge, or to blurt. And this is what she did. She just bl blurted it out. I'm one to, I want to run away from home. So it's, it's just, it's come, it comes and it, is, and it is, you can hear it. It's not something silent. It's not something in your heart. It comes out of your mouth. It's something that you open up. You divulge it. You open it up and you declare it and you say, I need, this is what I'm doing. I need, I need freedom. I need deliverance. I need healing. I need restoration. It says also here, it is powerful. It's literally of great strength or usefulness to confess. It means it is, it is effective, it is active, and it's operative. When we confess, there's power being released. It comes out of our system and it's now in the open. Because it's now in the open, Satan, can, Satan cannot have a power over you because it's now in the open. I remember many times, many, many, many years, I'm talking 86, 87, I was in Bible college. And uh, I have a friend, and we're still friends today. He's in the Cape Town. He's I don't want to say his name. He came into the Bible school, and we were a very strong youth group at the, at the congregation where we were. It was a charismatic uh, congregation. And we loved this man. He had such a sense of humor and such a sharp sense of humor. And he had a little bit of a stutter. And when he gets excited, he starts to... Um, I want to share this for you, with you. And uh, we just embraced him in, in the group, and uh, we enjoyed him as a person. And one evening, he invited me to dinner, and he took me to a very fancy restaurant. But we were just friends. I knew because I had no relationships with anyone, because it was not, it was not I'm at Bible school. I'm not looking for a husband. I'm at Bible school. I know God called me, and I'm on my way to the mission field. I don't, it's not, I'm not there for a husband, okay? And they knew it. I told them, so back off. And so, <laughs> and he invited me to dinner, and we ate, and we enjoyed the evening. And the end of the e evening, he touched my arm, and he says, I'm, I want to say something to you. He said to me, I'm gay. He shared his struggles, and he shared the flashbacks that he had, and he shared the conflict that he had in his heart, to, you know, in the Bible school and coming to faith and being baptized. And, and we shared this. And... Uh, he told me, and he told the youth leader, leader, because he said, I want to be accountable to somebody. I want, I, want God, I want God to touch my life and restore me, but I want to be accountable to someone. And uh, 20 years later, um, the others knew also. And they confronted me, the, 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 the young men confronted me, and they said, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you tell us? I said, if it was you, 
and you told me in confidence, would you not like me to keep your secret too and just pray for you? So this is the power of confession and trust. Is that when somebody confesses something to you, it's not yours to share. It's not your story to tell. It is a confidential thing between you and that person and to be accountable. If you're addicted to pornography and you come and confess to me, then you're accountable to me. I can, I can check on you and say, how are you doing? How are you? If you're addicted to whatever, a substance, and you confess it to me, then there's accountability. And that's why there's a power in operation. But the word in James 5, the key word is pray. The key word there, he says, do you suffer? Are you afflicted? You should pray. If you're glad at heart, praise God. If you're sick, let the others come and pray for you, and the prayer of faith will heal you. And they will anoint you in the prayer of faith. Then he says in verse 16, he says, he, uh, in, in, sorry, in verse um, 17, now he, he brings something in. He says, Elijah was a human being with a nature such as we have. And when we think about Elijah, where do we go? We go to Mount Carmel. We, we go to that profound, powerful display of the prayer of Elijah. You know, the, the prophets of Baal, and when fire came out of heaven and consumed the whole lot, amen, the, the altar and the offering, we go there. When we think about Elijah, we think about how he, the, he prophesied. We think about the power. And Paul, uh, James comes and he says, Elijah was a human being with a nature such as we have, with feelings, affections, and a constitution just like ours. There was no difference between you and Elijah. This is what James wants to convey. He says, what makes Elijah, Elijah is the following. And he prayed earnestly for it not to rain. And no rain fell on the earth for three years and six months. And the word there, God didn't tell him to pray. He did not, it was not, a, he did not prophesy. He prayed that there will be no rain. And then he prayed again, and the heaven supplied rain, and the land produced its crops. So the key word is prayer. And with prayer, the other word that links with prayer is faith. So if Elijah could pray for fire to come from heaven, and James wanted to tell you, pray. Pray when you're afflicted. Pray when you're ill-treated. Pray when you're sick. Pray and confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Then he says, just like Elijah, there will be evidence. There will something will happen when you pray. Amen. Amen? He says, God hears and answers our prayers despite our human frailty. Because Elijah, he had a temper. He really had a temper because remember when the children um, mocked him? He called a bear out of the woods. That's the power of Elijah. He was not grace, full of grace and compassion when he called a bear on the kids. But he was fed up. And he had himself gewip and to roep hy die beer. So, if you're struggling with, your, with anger, pray. If you're struggling with this, pray. Many of us think that we cannot be great prayer warriors like some about whom we hear. But this passage says that answered prayer is the privilege of every Christian. Amen. Don't underestimate the power of your prayers. Because the next verse says, My brethren and sisters, if anyone among you strays from the truth and falls into error, and another person brings him or her back to God, let the latter one be sure that whoever turns a sinner from his evil course will save that one's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. When you share the gospel, when you bring somebody back, when you see somebody trespass, when you see somebody is falling into sin and into the trap of sin or falling into addiction and you know it, then you, if you go and share the truth with him, you can save that person's souls. And the word says, and you will cover a multitude of sins. Why? 
because of the forgiveness. When you tell them, I forgive you. I've, I should have known better. I forgive you. I should have, I forgive you. Because we stand there before the cross of Jesus Christ. And that robber said, Lord, think of me when you come into paradise. And he says, today, today, you will be with me. There was no counseling session. There was no consultation. He, just because of his faith, because of your faith, there's power to forgive. And the power, Jesus gave it to us. The power to forgive, to release people and say, you go, be free in Jesus' name. And so the word says, it says in, in, in uh, James, I want to read it. My brethren, that I've read it, I've jumped, let me see. James, let's go to James. I want to read the latter part also. I did not put it on my iPad. Listen to, to this, James. James 5. Ah, oh, it's here. I did not finish the reading. Okay, thank you, Holy Spirit. He says, Confess to one another, therefore, your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins, and pray for also for one another, that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. And here it comes. The earnest, earnest, oprachte, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man or woman makes tremendous power available. It is dynamic in working. And this is what it means. It is effective. It is active. It is operative. So don't please, please ever. It is not, it is not your model prayer. It is not your modulation, the way you pray. It is not your method of prayer. It is not your recipe of prayer. It is your heart. It is the condition of your heart, the heartfelt, earnest, continued prayer of the righteous availeth much power. It is also in what do you say do you speak according to the word or do you speak your own ideas? Do you declare the word or do you speak your own opinion? Do you, do, do you come to God with faith or do you come to God with religion? Do you come with your merits, with your bargaining chips and say, God, I did this and this and this and this and now I ask you to do this and this and this and this. That's not faith. That's a bargaining council. You want to bargain with God. And God doesn't, he responds to merits, but he do, do not ask you merits. Why do you say that, Alma? Many, many times, church, it is like, I don't know the scripture, you can go and Google it. There was this man and he said, Lord, if you give me the victory, the first person that comes out of my house, I will offer to you. Remember? God did not ask him to do that. God did not ask him, what will you give me? Then I will give you the victory. He himself offered something. And who came out? His only daughter. His only daughter come, came out and he had, to, he had to obey his own word. Many, many times we want to give weight to our prayers by saying, God, if you answer my prayer, I will do this. You don't have to do that. Because God will take you on your word. God requires faith. Hebrews 11, 6 says, He who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He says, it is your faith that pleases God. It is not your bargaining or your merits to give your, your prayer some weight and you feel better. Well, I've promised God something. Now he must promise me something back. God, do not require that from you. This is a human thing. People did that in the Word. But if you read the context, God never asked them to do that. Never. It was not on the table. They offered that merit. They offered that bargaining chip. 
They offer it. And then God responded because the way you approach God, He will approach you. And so come by faith, church. Don't step into a trap where you promise God something and you make an oath towards God. And then in the end, because you're a human and you're a frail human, you cannot comply to your own oath. Come on, church. God requires your faith, not your oath. God requires your faith, not I swear to God, I will do this. He said, no, we do not swear to God. God swore by himself because there was no higher authority to swore by, Hebrews says. God by himself swore, but there was no higher authority. He said, I believe you. I promise you. Because I'm God, I will promise you and I will fulfill my word. But please don't step into that trap to give your prayer some weight, to give your prayer some, you know, a bargaining uh, angle. You know, if it comes by the Spirit, yes, that's okay. But don't offer something to God that He did not ask from you. Amen? David says, I will pay my vows. Because God will require you to pay what you vow to Him. He will require it of you. He will ask. He said, okay, you, you, you offered me that, so I require it from you. Amen? So today, I want to extend the invitation. The invitation in the room and atmosphere is not just for your salvation, but it's also for your healing. It's also for your restoration. It's also for your deliverance from any addiction in whatsoever way it, come, it presents itself. It is also for the small and the large things that's wrong in your body. God is interested in us to be healed and to be strong. He, he wants us to operate in faith. He wants us to walk in faith and freedom. That's why he said, the spirit of the Lord, Lord, is upon me to announce, to release, to heal, to. The anointing is here to do something. It's not just here for, you know, stand here and enjoy it is to do something for you. And through you, as you walk out, the anointing goes with you. The presence of the Holy Spirit goes with you to do something, to step into a room and to lighten up and bring deliverance and to bring, you know, restoration and healing. So that's the invitation on the table today. Amen. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, In Him we have redemption, deliverance and salvation through His blood. The remission of and forgiveness of our offenses, our shortcomings and trespasses in accordance with the riches and the generosity of his gracious favor. I just want to answer a question in the spirit. I hear it. Alma, so is it wrong to go for counseling? No. No. I myself go for, if I cannot help myself, I go for counseling. I've got somebody that I go to and say, I've tried to work this through. I tried to, to get rid of this. I cannot help myself. I need somebody. So I need to speak to somebody. That is also the part of confession, confessing. Is you speaking to somebody. So it can take the, take the form of a counseling session where somebody with maturity and wisdom can lead you and give you guidance and pray for you for deliverance. So don't think, you know, counseling is out. No, no, we need counseling. But sometimes it's just necessary for you to confess. Say, Lord, I'm honest. I confess my trespass. I confess my sin. Because 1 John 1, 9 says, if we freely admit, not with, do you? Do you admit? Do you admit? <laughs> do you admit? <laughs> no, if we freely admit that we have sinned. Freely. That's the grace of God. God doesn't stand there with a stick to hit you when you yeah. Confess your sin. Confess your sin. No. If we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus. Because of the cross. He's faithful and just. True to his own nature and promises and will forgive our sins. Dismiss our lawlessness. And continuously cluster. And continuously cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's a continuous washing, washing. He will not leave you. Even if you slip back again and you confess again, he will, he will wash you again. He will restore you again. 
And that's where you need a word-based church. Many times people phone me and they ask me, the first thing is, do you do deliverance? I said, it depends. It depends. On what does it depend? Because sometimes people don't want to do the work. They just want you to rebuke the devil, and then they, can, they don't want to get into the word. They don't want to break that cycle. They don't want to step away or come into the fellowship of the saints. They just want you to, to chase that devil away. And the word of God says, Jesus said, if you chase that devil away, it goes out into dry places, waterless places, and it seeks. So it's seeking a new host. And if it does not find a host, it will come back. And if it finds the house clean and, and open, he will go back and get six others, seven others, and they will come back, and you will be worse off. The word says that. So you must be careful to pray for casting out devils, because if you just cast out a devil and there's not a support of word, you are worse off than you have been before. So you need, you need prayer, you need deliverance, but you need the word. You cannot just go around and deliver people, deliver people. There must be, that's why Jesus says, you be healed or be free and sin no more. How do I do not sin no more? It's because of the word. You need the word. Many times people just go around in cycles. You, you pray for them, the demon goes, and they, in six months they're back and they're worse. Then you need to deliver again. But in that six months, they did not attend the church. They do not read their Bible. They do not pray. They do not adhere to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So it says here, If we freely admit that we have sinned and confessed our sins, He is faithful and just, true to His own nature and promises, and will forgive our sins, dismiss our lawlessness, and continuously cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Everything unrighteousness, what is unrighteousness? Alma. Everything not in conformity to His will, in purpose, thought, and action. That is unrighteousness. I'm not in conformity to His will, His purpose, His thoughts, and His actions. So righteousness means I conform, I shape into his will, I shape into his purpose, I shape into his thoughts, I shape into his action. That is righteousness. Then I'm right with God. Isaiah 55 says, his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our And then he says, let, let the unrighteous um, forsake his thoughts. You have to turn, like Martin said, turn away. Dry, dry, but dry. You must dry. Because that's repent. You turn away. So let the unrighteous or the wicked forsake his thoughts and come back to the thoughts and things of God. Amen.